Welcome, Ronan. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so today I'm going to talk um, about the work we're doing in uh, IASO, which I just learned to pronounce about 10 minutes ago from a Greek speaker, but we call ourselves IESO. And um, basically this is going to be about how, what we're, how we're um, basically using NLP and deep learning to kind of quantify what is happening in one-to-one -one therapy. So just a little bit of kind of outline and uh, history of the company. Um, currently, most uh, kind of therapy and psychotherapy happens in a one-to-one -one setting, and the kind of tools that a therapist has at their disposal are uh, their training and the experience, i.e. the number of patients they've seen to date. Um, if, you, if you want to equate this with kind of physical medicine, um, in the last 100 years, uh, doctors have got uh, MRI scanners, uh, measure your heart rate. They have got lots of kind of technical uh, measurement devices such as they can um, help them to better diagnose and treat their patients. But uh, psychotherapy hasn't really moved on, with, uh, or not, not yet. And the kind of future psychotherapy will be uh, to complement uh, therapist training and experience with things like data-driven indicators of response uh, to specific uh, uh, what are called mechanisms of change um, and the use of natural language processing and machine learning to understand what is actually going on in therapy and what is actually affecting that change. Uh, if you, if you, on top of this, you could, put, you could have personalized treatment plans that are recommended um, based on the entire kind of network of uh, therapy that's been seen to date and in the future early detection such that we can sort of prevent uh, um, the onset of mental, Ill mental illness. Um, so who are we? Um, we're an online provider of one-to-one -one therapy, so just like you meet a therapist in a kind of bricks and mortar setting, we, have, uh, we connect a patient with a therapist online in a, in a chat room. Other than that, the therapy is the same as you would get in, um, in, in a real-life setting. Um, the, it's real-time typed conversations, so we don't have voice, we don't have video offerings yet. Um, and so with the data that we have is, is kind of all typed, spelling mistakes included. And the timeline of the kind of company and how it's kind of developed is that it was actually founded by two psychologists back in 2003. It was called Psychology Online then. It was very much kind of an organic sort of, uh, there's this internet thing, maybe we can do sort of therapy with it. Um, and it started out basically uh, kind of a garage sort of kind of setting. And in 2000, and one of the kind of major developments in kind of mental health in the last kind of 20 years has been the development of IAPT, which is uh, improving access to psychological therapies. And this was an initi initiative set up by the NHS to basically train a bunch of therapists in evidence-based uh, psychotherapy and uh, mandate a minimum uh, data set, which is that every patient who is seen on the NHS has to have a certain, certain sort of self-reported questionnaires. Um, um, documented, um, their scores have to be documented and a certain minimum amount of information has to be uploaded to the NHS for it to be able to be treated, to, to, to basically to be able to measure i.e. how successful people are being in kind of engagement and recovery and so forth. Um, there was a Lancet publication in 2009 which showed that the, the way of doing uh, psychotherapy online is uh, effective. Um, and in 2013, the kind of the kind of storage of kind of all kind of interactions between a therapist and a patient started, um, and from that um, kind of kind of early kind of NLP and machine learning approaches were um, trialed to kind of see if there was some sort of useful information in this that could um, help increase the effectiveness of therapy. So currently, we're avail the patients we see are uh, on the NHS. Um, so to date, we've treated, or we've been, 40,000 patients have referred, and we have roughly about 180,000 transcripts um, at therapy sessions. Um, just to kind of a bit of a background, I guess, about uh, what 40,000 therapists referred kind of ultimately boils down into, of people who are referred, about 50% don't engage with treatment. Okay, and of the 50% 50, 50 who do engage, about 50% of those get to recovered state. Okay, so obviously increasing engagement is important, and obviously driving up the effectiveness of the 
uh, the dosage of psychotherapy that you're getting is, is also an important part to actually improving people's lives. <coughs> so what is CBT? So CBT is actually the type of psychotherapy that we deliver. Um, it's a focused, uh, goal-orientated therapy. So a uh, patient presents with a specific problem and you try and basically resolve that problem. This is in contrast to, uh, to like psychodynamic therapy where uh, which is very kind of prominent in the US where you have a therapist and you have a therapist till for the end of your life and you meet once regularly and there's not so much measurements of uh, symptom reduction or um, it's not so much goal oriented. Um, there's self-reported measures of symptoms, so these are questionnaires that indicate how severe your symptoms are. Um, they're typically, the, the NHS mandates PHQ-9 and GAD-7, one is a measurement of depression, um, and the GAD-7 is a measurement of uh, anxiety. And the 9 and 7 refer to the number of questions that are in those questionnaires. Um, the recovery rate for NHS England was about, in 2017 was about 50%. Um, the advantages of doing this online are, first of all, there's, um, you can increase access, so you can, um, uh, people who, there's a lot of uh, stigma about mental health, so people who uh, may not want to take time off work because they, they may feel that the, they're not able to open up to their boss or explain why they might want to leave work early. Um, they can go and see a they can see a therapist in the evening, or for places that say in the Highlands of Scotland or whatever, uh, your nearest therapist may be hundreds of miles away. So you can you can you can it kind of increases your uh, the access in that way. Um, the availability to reread transcripts, so patients do go back in therapy and reread what has actually happened. So that's a lot easier, obviously, if it's transcribed. Um, there's an online inhibition effect. Okay, there's kind of negatives to that in the sense of trolling and things that we see on Twitter, but there's also kind of positive aspects to that, so you tend to open up and you share more online. Um, it can be quality controlled because we're stored, the, the, all the interactions are stored, and our recovery rates for 2017 were uh, around 55%. So what sort of data do we have in our, um, uh, we store, in general, uh, patient presents, um, um, we get demographic information, medical history, location, age, gender, so forth. Then they're, um, if, they're diagnosed with a, if they're diagnosed with a mental health condition, they are uh, entered into treatment. And we have then they're delivered a number of sessions of psychotherapy with self-reported measurements with our GADs and our PHQ measurement devices and some domain, uh, 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 sorry, diagnosis specific conditions for OCD and so forth. Um, and these are conducted between every session. So you have an, uh, what you would hopefully see is sy uh, symptom um, reducing over time as you get a dose of therapy. Um, and it's typically, typically kind of short duration, six to 10 uh, sessions of therapy. And then we have outcome measurements. Recovery is defined as dropping below a certain threshold on these GAD and PHQ um, questionnaires. <coughs> Okay, so this is just a kind of brief example of kind of what might be going on. We have a, you have a therapist saying, hello John, are you there? Um, yes, I'm here. Great, welcome to this evening session. I had a look at your questionnaires and noticed your mood scores have improved slightly this week. How are you feeling at the moment? And uh, a dialogue would progress. So this is the sort of information we have. This is obviously a mocked up session, um, uh, but a realistic one nonetheless. Okay, so, what have we been doing this year? So I've been kind of running a project called the Therapy Insights Project. And basically what we're trying to do is understand what the therapist is doing in therapy. Um, and this is, I guess, to tease out what are the active ingredients in therapy. So if we want to equate this, we want to equate mental health with physical health, we want to be able to find out what it is about uh, uh, CBT that actually makes people better and if we can identify what that is well then we can promote that and with our therapists using training mechanisms and so forth give them feedback on their sessions and hopefully improve the quality of the service and make people um, uh, better. So what we do is we started with um, a clinical scientist so a person annotating um, transcripts from the therapist's point of view so they went and looked at these uh, 
utterances, so we're going to call these utterances by the therapist, and go through these and label them with a specific category with regard to what um, the therapist is trying to achieve. So very much like dialogue act modeling, where our uh, clinical science team came up with a set of 19 categories um, go by going to the literature and their experience by saying, oh, what is a therapist doing here and here and so forth. So we had a clinical scientist with a psychologist training uh, to go through uh, hundreds of hours of these um, with the goal of a machine learning uh, model uh, learning this task. Um, and once our machine learning model is trained up to a certain standard, we apply this to our entire corpus, so to, it's just so we have measurements of, of um, basically past dosages and um, basic aspects of therapy that uh, happened. And then we can look at what happened in, we can look at what drives recovery. So we have all the, the, the measurements of symptom reduction throughout therapy and whether a person recovered and we can look at uh, is something correlated with recovery i.e. is setting agenda or mechanisms of change which is a specific category of utterance um, uh, and if they're correlated with and how much they're correlated with outcomes. Okay so here are just a few examples of the kind of categories as I said there are 19 in total um, some of these are sort of like, so risk check is assessing if a patient is at risk or suicide, of suicide or self-harm. So the example I, I see from your question here is you're having some thoughts of self-harm and that's one of those questions that's specifically in the PHQ-9, so it asks about that. And, and a, a therapist would want to, if you're particularly high in a particular category you would, or a question, you would want to kind of tease that out more. Uh, set agenda, deciding the prioritizing topics to discuss during therapy session. So what issues would you like to focus but us to focus on today's session, things like reviewing homework. So CBT, um, is, uh, a part of CBT is actually actively doing things outside of the session and actually um, either possibly if you have anxiety it could be uh, going to a public place or speaking or uh, other aspects like that that might challenge like with your uh, anxiety. Um, change mechanisms itself, so these are actually employing uh, cognitive and behavioral strategies to design to promote therapeutic change. And these are a lot about CBT is skill teaching and kind of challenging kind of the thoughts and cognitions that you're having. Um, and there are specific change mechanisms uh, in CBT for doing that. We've, in an initial sense, just put them into one category called change mechanisms, but there are a large body of them. There are over 100 different specific ones for specific conditions. Um, planning for the future, eliciting feedback, and other. Other is sort of important in the sense that it kind of gathers together all sort of non-therapeutic chat. Um, it might be talking about the weather initially, various other things that might happen, oh my internet connection died, and some other types of chit chat that wouldn't be really um, uh, therapeutic, um, of therapeutic value. Um, so, when a so when our annotator went through and annotated according to all these categories, <coughs> I should mention at this stage that the annotator's task, he could apply multiple um, tags to a specific utterance such that you could be have a greeting and a mood check in one kind of hello how was your mood today um, and what we did was we used a deep learning model to actually uh, to, to learn this task so what we use is a hierarchical neural network um, and it's one of these ones that kind of incorporates context so for it, we have an example here so hi Jane how was your mood been let's set an agenda today there's three different utterances and these we what we did was use pre-trained embeddings, and these uh, embeddings were tra trained on the entire corpus of uh, transcripts, so we have kind of in-domain uh, embeddings. What we did is we kind of feed these into an LSTM, bidirectional LSTM for the, for the utterance, such that these are kind of words in context, and then we use pooling over that to give you a sentence representation, or I'm sorry, an, utter an utterance representation. Then what we did was we put another LSTM on top of that so they encoded context so you could have utterances in context. So each of these kind of red, pink circles here, are, you can think of that as an utterance in context. And this is because uh, CBT sessions are usually, obviously start with a hello and a, and a mood check, are usually the kind of two main ones at the beginning. And then agenda is setting towards the top. So you would have a higher probability of seeing that towards the top and this encodes context into that. Um, as I said, it's a, uh, it's, 
each of these is actually trained as, a, uh, you can do it conceptually, you can look at it as a binary, binary classifier because you're allowing multiple labels on a particular utterance. Um, um, <coughs> we can talk more about the details of what we're calling TIM, so it stands for Therapy, Therapy Insights Model. Um, just to, to see what the evaluation of this task is, uh, we looked at some baselines, so we looked at a multilayer perceptron just using simple unigram lexical features and no context to just see um, you know, is a, is a simple unigram model good enough for this task and what performance it gets on it. Uh, then we kind of used uh, Facebook's uh, Star Space, uh, which is an upgrade, upgrade on their fast text algorithm, which uses embeddings in uh, various ways to, for classification. And finally, we used it also by LSTM Max, just a bidirectional LSTM fed into uh, the final layer that would give us predictions on the categories. Um, and this was out without the sort of hierarchical model step models context. Um, the experiments uh, we were at, our clinical scientists annotated 290 hours of therapies. So that's about uh, 11,000 utterances. Uh, the model was trained on 230 hours of transcripts. Excuse me, um, tuned on 30 hours and tested on the remaining 30 hours. So we did a bit of hyperparameter tuning over these. Um, these um, hyperparameters here, um, and we use ma macro average F1. We also have micro average F1. So basically, what we want to see, we want a classifier that performs well on all these categories. So, um, so just a kind of a, a summary of kind of these uh, models and these baselines is that our uh, multilayer perceptron is the worst performing one, simply using just lexical features, bag of words. Then Starspace uh, has uh, the bigram model for Starspace worked best, and but uh, in terms of in terms of macro average F1, the a by LCM with max pooling still outperformed that. But however, when we add in this context kind of layer, so the hierarchical LSTM, it performs much better. So the, these two are two different types of hierarchical LSTMs. One is a bidirectional, so you're just going forward in the transcript. And the other one is you're going forward and backwards in the transcript, so you kind of have more context because you know when the transcript would be ending at that stage. So the kind of message from this is the context is important. And we kind of have some kind of more detailed results here. I'm not really going to go through all this mess of uh, figures here, but uh, just to look at things like goodbye. So obviously a goodbye should be, pretty, should be pretty easy to detect. There's only a certain number of ways you can say, you can sign off and say goodbye. So it's a high performance uh, kind of, F, uh, category, shall we say, and our, our bi-direct, the, uh, the bi-high bi-directional LSTM is where the highest performing in that, possibly because it knows when it's ending at the very end, it can, can label that as a goodbye. But things like change mechanisms is a little bit harder to detect because there's a lot of it, they can be quite long and there's kind of varied vocabulary that might be used there, so you might need more examples of that to actually get a higher performance. And there's some varying um, uh, co uh, varying performance for certain categories. Um, in general, so what does this all mean, I guess? So what we did was that we did an inter-annotator agreement study on this. And what we did was we got another therapist to annotate 20 transcripts for agreement purposes. So what, i.e. are we approaching the limits of what we can, uh, of how two humans might agree on the task. And what we can see here is the first column is, is the therapist uh, versus the original annotator. And what we did was we looked at Cohen's kappa for each of the individual uh, binary uh, binary classifiers, and we looked. And then you can see the average down here is 0.57. So for some of these categories, obviously, there's going to be more agreement than others. Goodbyes and hellos are probably pretty easy to agree upon. Um, when we look at the second, the second column shows uh, the machine learning model versus our original annotator, and we actually. Are, it's a higher uh, value, which probably indicates that the, the machine learning model has kind of learned some of the idiosyncrasy, idiosyncratic ways that the original annotator was uh, doing, uh, performing the task. And the final column there is uh, the, the, the remaining combination, which is the machine learning model with uh, the therapist, and this has uh, 0.5 average in Cohen's kappa. Now, this is kind of encouraging in the sense that uh, there's the agreement between another human is, 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 is quite good. Um, our other therapist was performing the task a little bit differently when we asked uh, her 
uh, how she was doing it. So she was also incorporating a bit of quality. So if, a, for example, if a therapist said, hi, how are you? That's a greeting, which is kind of okay. And is it a mood check or not? So our therapist was saying, no, that's not really a good mood check anyways, if it is a mood check. And I think our annotator was saying, well, it's an attempt at a mood check. It may be part of a greeting. And you can argue about thing, uh, aspects like that. So there was certain confusion classes, and one of them was actually mood check and obtain update. So uh, they, they can be phrased quite similarly. How's your mood now, as opposed to have you had to tell me since last week, or how have you been? Things like that might get uh, a little bit confusing, even for humans. And another one, a typical confusion class between all the machine learning model and the therapist and the original annotator was change mechanisms of formulation. And when you look at the literature, a formulation is the change mechanisms usually that kind of happen early on in treatment when you're trying to get the the, the patient to understand the original um, problem and formulation of the problem, um, and can be classed as a change mechanism. So. In general, we were quite happy with kind of this result, and what we did then was now that we have a kind of a measurement of what happens or the different aspects of what happened in therapy, what we can do is um, uh, see what correlates with um, our with outcomes. So we, what we did was apply this uh, Tim to annotate the entire collection. So. We looked at, uh, for the purpose of this study, I think it was 90,000 transcripts and uh, 13,000 cases, so 13,000 individuals. Um, and what we did was aim to predict recovery engagement and reliable improvement. I'll talk about recovery engagement um, in particular. And what we did was, if we want to equate sort of the, a therapy session with a, a, a dosage or an injection, what we did was we basically took the average for a particular case we took the average dose that a person was given, so in terms of words for a particular category. So uh, the word frequencies of each category in the sessions were added up and then divided by the total number of sessions. So we had a kind of an average injection. And then what we looked at, um, uh, very, we put this into a log logistic regression model to try and explain outcomes. Um, uh, we used six patient variables. These are things like demographics that we already know um, uh, uh, correlate with outcomes. For example, people who have long-term conditions uh, uh, tend uh, are to not recover as well as people who don't. Uh, older people uh, recover uh, better than younger people. Um, and, there's a, and there's a few others that uh, are significantly correlated with better outcomes. Um, we have 24 therapist variables, so our 19 annotated categories, and we had five regular exp expressions to capture kind of uh, style of um, kind of therapeutic alliance, which are things like expressions of empathy. Example would be, uh, oh, sorry to hear that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, thanks, um, I, oh, thanks for sharing that. That's great. Um, and things like therapeutic praise, a uh, great job. Thanks, well done on doing that, just to see if these were correlated as well. And they were just regular <coughs> expressions. Um, we also put in the number of sessions, so how many sessions you get. The more sessions on average, actually, the, is, is correlated with higher uh, uh, outcome rate, or sorry, um, recovery, and the average duration of a session. So these were, so we had, you're talking about 24, 6, 32 variables basically over this uh, logistic regression model for predicting. Will the person recover or not? And for engagement, is engagement by the NHS is defined as turning up for two sessions. And this is sort of um, for basically uh, you do not want to count recovery in terms of people who don't engage because the, they're not really getting the medicine, i.e., they're not taking it. So you're not finding out if the drug is. Uh, effective or not, so they're actually excluded from that. So engagement is also something you want to drive up, it's people who will actually stay on in ther therapy, and you will also want to drive up <coughs> recovery rates. So these are uh, forest plots of uh, things that are uh, significantly, well, significantly correlated, shall we say, with uh, um, improvement. Uh, reliable improvement is dropping a certain amount on these uh, score uh, on the GAD or PHQ scores. It's over a certain number of points. Um, 
so these are the aspects that are correlated with improved odds. <coughs> and a standardized odds ratio is if you increase the, the amount of uh, this particular uh, uh, item with one standard deviation, how much will your odds of, of recovery or improvement, in this case, increase? And so this would, this would if you in, increase therapeutic praise by one standard deviation, um, you would see an increase of uh, the odds of recovery of 20%. Um, so we can see there's certain um, things that are statistically significantly correlated with, uh, with, with sorry, improvement in this case. Some ones I just want to draw your attention to is change mechanisms here which is, sort of val is some sort of validation on that. And I will talk about therapeutic praise in particular and change mechanisms um, in, the kind of, in a summary slide. Um, so this is somewhat encouraging that there are aspects that uh, significantly um, predict uh, improvement. And in terms of negative uh, predictors, we have, I'm just going to draw attention to other here, and risk check which is here. Okay, so okay, what, what might those all mean? Well, okay, <laughs> correlation does not imply cause. And just to kind of go to the kind of risk check example. So saying if the risk check is negatively correlated with recover or improvement in this case, where our message would not be don't do a risk check. It would be that typically uh, therapists are probably doing risk check because their patients are quite severe. And so you would want to be obviously careful about interpret interpreting this in a kind of causal sense. And, uh, um, but on the other hand, uh, other othery type things, i.e. chit chat, uh, things that we can <coughs> classify as therapy, therapy um, are also ne are negatively correlated. And these are looking into these, these are expression, these are not delivering therapy. So in that, in that uh, sense, we do have an, an insight or a hypothesis that these are not, th this, is, this may be a causal a factor in uh, improvement. Going back to the change mechanism of therapeutic praise, while the therapeutic praise looks to be quite a, let's say a predictor of improvement, we think this is also reflective in the sense that you tend to say, well done, good job, your scores have dropped, all these positive things when a patient is already improving in, in, their, in their actual treatment. And so this may be reflective of a patient getting better. Well done, you're getting better. It's not really necessarily causal. And to tease out this, we need uh, kind of um, um, strong, better models for um, causality. Change mechanism, on the other hand, when you actually look at what the actual change mechanism utterances are, they're, off, they're to do with skill teaching and so forth, and they're actually meant to be the meat and bones of CBT. So we're actually quite excited that this has actually come out as, a, as correlated with uh, patients who improve. Um, moving on, so the, the study to do with engagement is basically taking the very first uh, session of CBT that a person comes to and from that session can you predict whether they'll uh, come to the next session and that is uh, once they've come to two sessions they're deemed engaged by the NHS and such to getting treatment and we want to be able to early uh, in uh, therapy we want to be able to find out if they're going to if they're at likely a high likelihood of dropping out and do something about that. Uh, things that are highly correlated and significantly correlated with them engaging in treatment are change mechanisms, arranging the next session in the first session. Um, again, whether that is causal or, um, uh, or not remains to be seen. Uh, setting a, uh, arranging the next session may be um, that you're giving them it's rude to t not turn up for a session when it's arranged for you and making sure that's done in the actual therapy session may be important. There may be an onus on them to not let you down and so forth. Um, but wh or whether something has gone wrong in the first session and the therapist knows that this isn't for right for them and so they don't arrange a next session, it, um, it remains to be seen whether that's causal. And the therapeutic thanks formulation in eliciting feedback. This is eliciting feedback is where a therapist might say, um, uh, how was the session for you today? Is there anything else I'm, uh, you would like to discuss or change about this? So that's a kind of important from a kind of therapist point of view. And things that are negatively correlated are things like other uh, therapeutic empathy and planning for the future. Um, 
So kind of the summary of kind of the, these findings are that we seem to think that active CBT talk is significantly correlated uh, with improved, well, it is significantly correlated with improvement engagement. Whether that's causal or not, uh, we have to tease out yet. Um, non therapeutic talk, uh, other E type statements, which cons comprises quite a large amount of therapy, um, is uh, significantly ne neg negatively correlated with both engagement and improvement. Um, and as I said, more work needs to be done to tease out causality. So, what we might be doing towards that is uh, there are models that uh, look at um, longitudinal data for across <coughs> individuals, and you, you, we, we're, we're looking at these in future work to kind of to tease out the dynamics of change, how a person changes. Do they change more towards the beginning of therapy after a large amount of change mechanisms, or 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 not? So that we'll get a, kind of a stronger signal in regards to what causes what. Um, the subcategorization of change mechanisms, so this is something we're doing at, right at the moment, which is uh, subcategorization of these change mechanisms to one of five different kind of categories, such that we can begin to tease apart what types of change mechanisms work for what conditions. So the types of anxiety or different types of depression that you may want to give uh, different types of uh, change mechanisms, me mechanisms <coughs> for. Um, and then analyzing patient language. So what we haven't talked about is how patients are responding to uh, therapy and how you may want to, early in therapy, analyze their traits, certain traits that they might exhibit. Uh, I, I, are they highly agreeable, for example? Um, are they likely to respond to uh, treatment? And what can you do, and devising strategies um, respect to if they're not going to respond to treatment. Um, a future project that, uh, that someone actually preempted here and asked about was this idea of capturing behavioral data. So putting a, like a Fitbit, uh, getting data from a Fitbit so patients might be in treatment and you can get a variety of kind of heart rate, uh, exercise, sleep, because um, sleep, sleep patterns, exercise are highly um, uh, important when, when talking about mental health um, and early stage, ultimately early stage detection of uh, mental health conditions. So ultimately, you might have an app on your phone or something on your watch that has uh, s signals on it and would uh, contact your men mental health provider and say that you're you basically under a lot of stress lately or, or have early predictors that you may and strategies that can prevent you from uh, developing uh, a mental illness. Um, and, and as I said, the, the, the causal dynamics of change. So obviously this isn't a one-man effort. There's, we have a team, an ISO, um, um, that are made up of these people who've worked on this project. And uh, what I'm going to do now is actually kind of show a little bit of a demo of kind of how we kind of have time. Do I have time? Yeah. Yes, of course. Yes. Of course. Excellent. Um, to, uh, a little demo of kind of how we uh, see this um, system kind of in operation. <coughs> okay. So this is a. Uh, this is kind of let's say you might have mobile or something like that. Say so the patient view and the therapist view. And they've kind of started. This is a live demo in the sense that I can type in something there and it will kind of categorize it um, from the therapist side point of view. But if I run through kind of a transcript, if I can move this in the right direction, being a mirror image. Oh, bad at driving. Right, we're playing that one there. So this is an example of. Uh, these are sort of mocked up but realistic examples of uh, how therapy some, can sometimes go awry in the sense that the discussion gets a little bit off topic and it's more kind of advice giving rather than actual therapy. And as you can see here, the therapist side of the conversation is in white and that's getting uh, tagged in real time as, uh, as the session progresses. So you could see ultimately how this could become part of the actual site where a therapist is getting kind of their things labeled and they know that they're kind of saying things in a particular way that the system is picking it up. Um, and this is kind of, the, I think they're talking about uh, what they did at the weekend, in the beginning and 
it kind of I don't think they ever get to agenda setting in this and it becomes more of a, a chat with a friend for example here on the, the right hand side is a session plan which uh, kind of indicates the certain things that should be done in therapy and these are kind of automatically getting ticked off as they, as they appear in therapy um, and I'll just let that run for a, for a second I can f put a fast forward button in it so okay so apologies if you were reading that um, and then they all get they get tagged and we can see actually, actually I think this was the this was a good session so everything got marked as being done and uh, if we go over here we have an end session button so this is another example of what we might be feeding back to a therapist in regard to uh, what was basically the content of the therapy session. So these are meant to be kind of progress kind of circles, bar, bars slash circles. And these are six, um, uh, six categories that we deem were kind of important in therapy and that are sort of evidence based, sorry, data driven, shall we say. And I think so things like setting agenda is extremely important. Uh, giving feedback change mechanisms were located with about three quarters of what you should be doing in therapy to affect change were done. Um, and then it gives a breakdown of other annotations. These other annotations are, let's say, the ones that were not statistically significantly correlated with outcomes. And so basically, feeding this back to a therapist might, over time, they might say, okay, I'm never setting agendas. Maybe I should you know, start organizing that a little bit better so that the patient knows exactly what's going on, etc. So, um, and this is sort of a, a very kind of a, an initial way that this might be fed back for quality control. Um, <coughs> <coughs> and just I'll just pop up the other one just to show sorry that was the good session so am I getting better at driving this did I click two or one the last time did we see John already uh, yes. mm, no. yeah, the, yeah, yeah, this we did that yeah, one this okay one. let's do yeah. this so uh, and a second, <laughs> hello and then continues on. I'm just going to fast forward that. And we can see that there's a few things that were not done in this, uh, this <coughs> session. And when we look at this in terms of its sort of uh, kind of summary, session summary, we can see there's a number of things missing in, in, in this, and that this uh, would be an example of a, a session that kind of went awry, possibly, or was kind of led off course. And this is, uh, you can see this ultimately being useful for, first of all, quality control, such that if a pair for in this case, the NHS are paying for uh, psychotherapy that before we have no idea what goes on in the therapy room, whether the, the therapist is applying their training and skills, um, but now we have kind of feedback for them to improve. And we very much see ISO as actually training therapists as well and letting them uh, see the knowledge of the entire kind of network that we have and the data that we've stored. Uh, in terms of insights such that they can improve their care. So, um, that is it, I believe. Thank you very yeah, much. Thanks. So, thank you, Royal, and we.